Good morning and good afternoon for those who have joined us today for week three of the Sophos XG Firewall Academy. My name is Jade Evans and I'm the event marketer manager here at Sophos and will be your host for today. For those who have joined us at the moment, we will be starting in a few minutes just while the numbers are still increasing and hit that on the hour clock. So just a reminder, we'll be starting in the next two to three minutes. Thank you. Hello and good morning and good afternoon. Welcome again to today's seven session out of our nine technical educational webinars for the Sophos XG Firewall Academy. For those who've joined us for throughout the duration, welcome back. And for those who are new for today's session, I'm just gonna go over a couple of housekeeping points before we start today's session. All attendees will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. However, please free to post questions via the Q&A panel, which will be located on the right-hand side of your screen. Join us for today's session. We have our dedicated Sophos experts who will be answering all your questions while we're watching today's session, getting the most from XG, managing and accessing remotely. After today's recording, we will be addressing the most relevant questions live with JS again. And finally, for those who are unable to join us for the duration, we will be recording today's sessions and all recordings will be made available within 24 hours on our registration page, which can be found on screen. For those who may need to catch up with sessions one to six, you'll also find these recordings again on our event registration page, which is displayed on screen. The URL is events.sophos.com slash EMEA XG Academy. So without further ado, wishing you all a nice and informative session. Don't forget to ask lots of questions, sit back and enjoy number seven recording. Hello and welcome to session seven of Sophos XG Academy 2021. Today we'll be talking about managing and accessing the XG remotely. My name is Ben Davis and I'm a Sophos sales engineer for the Central Region. Some of the topics that we will be covering in here, including the remote client access with the IPsec and SSL VPN and the client list VPN portal. We will also cover the site-to-site -site VPNs, 
the SSL VPN, the IPsec, and cover the subsections of IPsec, policy-based, route-based, and even talks a bit and show you some SD-WAN. Then we'll also uh, talk about the remote Ethernet device, or RED as we like to call them. So let's start off with remote client access. With IPsec, uh, selectable uh, WAN interfaces, uh, be able to select which interface you want. If you have a dedicated internet connection for remote connectivity, that will help. Uh, just like all other VPNs, we have our authentication for pre-shared key or PSK and digital certificate. And this is available through some of the methods of user authentication, like the local built in the XG, AD, and even radius, where you can get more extended features through there. Now, newer to the version 18 is the advanced settings of IPsec. These used to belong in the Sophos Connect admin client that is now legacy. This is now all in there. You no longer have to install another client to get these configurations. As you can see here, uh, you can send the security heartbeat through the tunnel. And this becomes really important when you're trying to ensure the high level of security and you got your remote clients and they all have Sophos Intercept X on it. Uh, this will enhance your security posture. Also, we have on there uh, prompting users for 2FA. This is very important in today's landscape as a lot of users still like to reuse their passwords and they don't really utilize password managers. And if they do, they're just storing the same passwords. So 2FA is still a very big thing. We have Sophos Authenticator for that. And then we also have assign the DNS suffix. This is always one of those big things when you have users that are used to being in the office and now they're working remote and they're used to just going to file share and they never were putting in a DNS suffix. So you can put that in there. So while they are connected to the VPN, they can still type file share in there and be able to get connected. Now on to SSL VPN. The SSL VPN utilizes the SSL encryption just like in HTTPS. We have the ability to do TCP or UDP. And this really comes down to what traffic you're using on there and how you're utilizing it. As specified, as you can see in the image, is UDP is best for performance. But there are some applications that really do like the TCP to ensure that uh, maintain that connection. We also have the ability to customize the port on there. This becomes really important when you have a lot of inbound connections and other NATs that you are you're not using a port that is already in use. And we support clients like Sophos Connect Client on Windows and OpenVPN. Now for client lists, we have our bookmarks and we also have bookmark groups where you, it's a group of bookmarks. These bookmarks are configurable uh, on the XG firewall and you can configure them with protocols such as HTTP and HTTPS for web clients. Uh, we have the FTP suite with FTPS and SFTP. And then we do have SSH, Telnet, and RDP. This provides you the ability to configure and control and provide specific access to resources within a network behind the XG firewall. The XG firewall then will proxy this traffic through and give them access. This is really good when you have someone temporarily coming in that you do not want to have to install a client on or they do not want to. Also provides just quick access to resources within the network. Some of the recent updates that have happened in version 18. In MR3 release, we did a four to six times increase in supported concurrent SSL VPN connections. This is, depends on the model you have. This is very important in today's time when you have a lot of remote workers out there and you do not have the budgets to buy bigger appliances to support this. 
we have optimized our firmware to ensure the capability of more SSL VPN sessions. Also, we have added support uh, groups for the Sophos Connect VPN client. Now you can create a group and add it to the Sophos Connect client and then add users to it on the XG firewall. In MR4, we are now enforcing TLS 1.2. You can also, as you saw previously on the IP sec slide is that you can now download the Sophos Connect VPN client directly from the XG firewall. And also, as you saw, is the new advanced options are now in there as well. Let's go over some remote access best practices. First, the one of the obvious ones, configuring multi-factor authentication or MFA, you know, commonly referred to also as two-factor authentication or 2FA or OTP and also TOTP time, one time password. We have this via our Sophos Authenticator. We also support other authenticators. This is a Sophos product, so I suggest the Sophos Authenticator. One of the other big ones is provide access to only what is needed. If a user does not need access to the entire network of the office, you do not have to put their user to have the entire network of the office when they're remotely connected. If they're just connecting to the network to RDP into their work machine, or they're just connecting to a specific share in there, then just give them access to that. Then you don't have to worry about any risk being taken. If that account is to be compromised, you know specifically what they had access to. Try using a digital certificate over a pre-shared key. You can create these via Microsoft CA or OpenSSL. This provides a higher level of protection on there as you don't have a pre-shared key that can be potentially brute forced. Brute forcing over a period of time you may not realize and then they have connection to your system. Now, one of the big ones is using remote client VPN over WAN HTTPS management. You'll see this throughout the XG firewall and the banners, especially when you go to enable WAN management on there, is it will suggest to not use that. It is still very highly suggested to not expose the management interface of your firewall to the internet. They already get enough information on there, so why provide them a, a login forum where they can try logging in? And one of the big ones, is audit every couple months. If you go through and audit the users and validate and verify that those users still need access or they still need access to those resources, then that can be a really big thing. If you had a contractor come in that worked at your company for a few months and you did it through a remote client and then they left, there's no need to have that user there anymore. So auditing every once in a while and removing access to things that are no longer needed, is pretty much a really good thing. Let's talk about some of the site-to-site -site VPN options. So our three main ones is the IPsec policy-based, IPsec route-based, and SSL VPN. Site-to-site, -site, I just put that in there so it doesn't get confusing that about the other one. Usually people think of SSL VPN as a client remote access. So let's compare policy versus route-based. Policy, is a site-to-site -site or host-to-host -host on there, whereas route-based is VPN. These are commonly what they are referred to as, is a site-to-site -site for policy-based and tunnel interface for route-based. With a policy-based, you get a single IPsec interface. You do not see this in the XG firewall. You can see it when you go into the CLI, but this is mainly just used for internal routing purposes. With the route-based, you get an XFRM interface on there that is configurable that you can put an IP on and you can route traffic to it. This is also a selectable gateway. For the number of VPNs, policy based comes ahead on that where it creates a tunnel for each local and remote subnets. So if you have two local subnets in the policy based VPN and one remote, you're gonna end up with two security associations in there. So 
if you have five local subnets and five remote subnets, then you'll end up with 25 security associations. Those security associations each have their own tunnels inside of the main phase one tunnel. This causes a little bit more overhead on there and utilizes more resources. Whereas the route base creates one single tunnel on there for the entire routed network. So depending on your situation, you may want to choose route based over policy based based off of this information. Now, when it comes to adding new networks to the VPN, policy based does require downtime. And I'm not saying minutes of downtime, I'm just saying a few seconds. Whenever you make a change to a policy based VPN, one of the phases is going to go down because now it has to do a whole new renegotiation and reassignment of the security associations. Whereas the route base, there is no downtime. All you have to do is just change your routes on there and now you're good. Policy base, there's no granular control over the routing. When it receives traffic, the extra firewall that is, it will route it to where it needs to go. That's what it will do based off of the policy. Route-based, you have a lot more granular control over everything. You can send traffic where you want. You can choose not to send traffic there. You can set metrics on it. So it gives you a lot more granular control over what you're doing on your VPN. So let's go over some more route-based information. So with routing options, you have static routing, then you have dynamic routing with supported protocols on the SG firewall like OSPF, BGP, and RIP. And you also have SD-WAN routing. It's a new thing out there and we support it. And as I said before, is when you create a route-based tunnel interface, there is an XFRM interface that's created for each policy on there so that you can route traffic to and from that interface. As you can see in the image on this screen, there is a route precedence, and we provide this to you, and it's configurable via the CLI. That'd be option number four in the CLI. And you can see the precedence by default is static routes, SD-WAN policies, and then VPN routes. Now let's talk about SSL VPN, the site-to-site -site one. It is a client server configuration, so you can kind of still think about this as if it is a remote access, but this is more of between two appliances. So you configure one to be the server and the, the other to be the client, the initiator. This is very useful for when IPsec is not working. There are still ISPs out there and vendors where they block IPsec. They're blocking 50 and 500. Uh, and so now since SSL VPN looks like HTTPS traffic, you can get through this issue and not have to worry about it. Now, if you're in a secure environment and you have access to an HTTP proxy server, you can utilize that as well to create the outbound connection on the client side. So when to use what type of VPN? So for policy-based, you're looking at generally a small network, maybe you know one network on each side, not looking to really expand anything. Maybe that appliance locally is not going to really change. No networks are going to change. Nothing's really coming. And it's very static, so you don't have to worry about it. Route-based, you're looking at generally larger networks, rapidly changing networks, you know, the cause for having dynamic routing, having dynamic redundancy, or if you want to utilize SD-WAN. This is also where if you really want to have granular control over your traffic and your VPNs, this is also a best choice. And for the SSL VPN, as we just discussed, it's really there for when IPsec does not work. If it's being blocked or there's restrictions someplace, or you're just having issues with setting up an IPsec VPN, just go ahead and set up an SSL VPN and see if it works. In the XG firewall, we also have IPsec failover groups. This is where we can fail over from a primary to secondary when the VPN goes down. The XG firewall will periodically check every 60 seconds to see if the primary VPN is back online. Then you can fail back over to the primary VPN as it is the chosen one. 
you can have several in there and this really is one of those good ones for when you have multiple WAN and maybe you're having VPNs up to cloud services like AWS or Azure that you can always ensure that you're on your fastest most reliable link on those VPNs but while ensuring that you still have access to your cloud resources over a secure connection. Let's talk about the Remote Ethernet Devices, or RED. Sophos has the SD20Ws and the SD-RED60Ws. They are the wireless models and non-wireless models though. These devices are capable with the firmware on 17.5MR11 and up, and 18MR1 and up, and also the UTM 97MR3. These wireless models are 802.11ac, or also referred to as Wi-Fi 5. These are nice little devices that come in handy when you want to deploy a device remotely. When you have users at a remote location that may not have any technical resources there, you can set these up with the XG firewall, and once they have internet, they'll reach out to a provisioning server and then configure. And that's it. All the user has to do is just plug in some cables and they'll create a VPN tunnel back. Now there are a couple modes for this. The first one we're gonna talk about is standard unified mode. This is where the XG firewall is managing the LAN. This is basically where that red device that you have put in that remote office is now routing all of the traffic back to the XG. This is where it will handle all the security and traffic. Any traffic destined for the internet will still go through the red tunnel back to the XG, have security applied to it and even web filtering, and then go out to the internet. The other method is standard split mode. This is where the internet traffic will go out the red device itself. It will NAT out the public IP that is provided on its WAN side, and then take all the LAN requests and send it across the red tunnel to the XG. This will be for something where you don't really need to provide any security on that internet based traffic, or you know, bandwidth is a limitation there, and you just wanna utilize the local internet to offload all of that. And the last mode is transparent split mode. So this is where you're putting a red device behind an existing router or firewall. This will be transparent to the network, as in it will only act on the traffic that is destined for the LAN networks at the XG firewall. All their traffic will just be passed through untouched by the red device. Let's talk about some best practices for site-to-site -site VPN. Just like the remote client access, we would suggest using digital certificates when possible and use long randomized PSKs. The XG firewall also has an RSA key defined that you can also utilize for this purpose. For crypto options, a lot of people just go and configure and utilize whatever the default is. In Sophos, that's correct, as we use what I consider is the best practice for the cryptography settings. Using DH group 14 or higher, Higher isn't always better as some of the encryptions are less, but in general sense, it is. I would just suggest saying 14. On the XG firewall, this will tell you when it is suggested to use a higher level. This goes with the encryption and authentication as well. For encryption, we consider AES-256 or higher to be pretty secure while ensuring performance. Same thing with authentication, SHA-2-256 or higher is really good as well. Now this comes with planning and testing. These encryptions may be what I consider the best and what Sophos desires you to have configured on your device to ensure the security of your traffic, but you need to plan this implementation. Maybe the remote device is not powerful enough to handle these. Maybe it is a temporary office location where you're using an older generation device to provide a connection until a newer generation device is able to replace it. Then you may have to tweak and turn down the encryption levels on there so that it can handle the processing of that traffic. You'll also wanna do some ping tests on there and maybe some file transfers if possible. 
This will really ensure that you get the best experience, especially if you have users on the remote end accessing file shares in the main hub location. If they're gonna be pulling SMB request files down, then you wanna ensure that they're getting the throughput that they require there. This may be a appliance limitation, it may be an ISP limitation, or it might just be some networking, but you wanna adjust and test and make sure. You don't wanna just go in, put it in, and build the VPN and see those green lights and be done with it. You wanna make sure that it is working as intended. Lastly, I really like using IPsec IDs on there. This really ensures that it's another form of saying, hey, this is you and this is me and identifying yourself. So just another layer in there. Trying to provide identification in layers is really good. It's really ensuring that when you're sending those packets out to those IPs, that they are arriving where it is, and then you're providing a secure tunnel. Or the secure tunnels are opening up your network to that other side. You want to ensure the other side is the person that you're trying to talk to. Now let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some configurations. I'm going to go ahead and create a tunnel interface connection between two XG firewalls and configure an SD-WAN routing configuration. Okay. Now I have a diagram here of the two locations, just so you can see, for reference. We're gonna have two XG firewalls at each end. There's gonna be an MPLS link between the two with these IPs. Then we have the tunnel interface VPN. There's the main office, and there's the remote office. And these are our two clients that we're gonna be testing today. Let's get in. Here's our main office firewall. This is an XG230 running Sophos 18.04. Let's go to the VPN. As you can see here, before I get started, I already have some VPNs created. As you can see, having a tunnel interface running an Ike v2 template policy to PFSense. I have a custom IPsec policy to a sonic wall. I also have another site to site to a UTM running 9.7. Just go take a look at that Sonic Walls IPsec policy. As you can see, the XG firewall already has a bunch of predefined IPsec policies, but there are some devices out there like a Sonic Wall that only like one crypto suggestion. They do not do groups-based suggestion, and if you try to do that, you end up having bad VPN tunnels or unstable VPN tunnels. So we just mirrored the configuration off of there. Let's take a look. As you can see here, I called this the default Sonic Wall 6.5. This is not a built-in one. This is something that I built. This one is for an Ike V2. And as you can see here, the default uh, at the time in the 6.5 firmware on a Sonic Wall utilizes DH Group 2. It also uses authentication, SHA-1, and it's AES-128. As you can see, the Sophos XG firewall is saying, hey, we don't like this. You should really honestly use something better. And you can see here on this flag, this configuration is not recommended. It is potentially insecure. This is something that, if possible, if you have access to the device, to go and change the encryption if possible. And if it is someone else that you're connecting to, another organization, maybe talk to them. Maybe they don't know that that is potentially insecure and they should change it. Maybe it's just another network admin on there that was told to set up a firewall. And that's the Sonic Wall default policy that I have created on there. Let's go ahead and create that IPsec connection, that tunnel interface to there. Let's go ahead and add. Let's call it to remote office. We really like adding those underscores in there to make it more readable. Let's change connection type to tunnel interface. 
change from dual to just IPv4. Why allow both on there? Or I'm just going to be sending IPv4 traffic. Always be very specific when possible. Really big thing in security. We're going to set this gateway type to respond only. There is another one of initiate connection. So one side is going to be the other. So in this case, the remote firewall is going to be the initiator. Let's go ahead and check the box for activate on save. This means once I click the save button after I'm done configuring this, it's automatically going to activate this VPN. It's not going to wait for me. We're going to do Ike v2 policy. Let's go ahead and use that RSA key. And let's save this. Now, this is red because we need the other RSA key. Let's go ahead and get into the other one. Let's look at the remote office firewall. Let's go to add. And let's call this to main office. Let's also set its connection type to tunnel interface, IP version to four, and activate on safe. Change its gateway type to initiate the connection. We'll also use the predefined IPv2 policy. Let's change its authentication type to RSA key. Let's go ahead and take the other key that we took from the other file and add it in there. And let's take this key, go to the back to the main firewall and add it in there. Now let's continue configuring the main office firewall. Let's set the port two as per the diagram we're using this interface. And then let's do the remote access of 10.10.1217. Let's just double check and make sure that's correct. Yep. Now, as you saw before, this is my best practice suggestion was to set local IDs. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's do IP address for each of them. Now, some of these, I like to really just keep it simple and just use the LAN IP addresses on there. It can be anything really. I just like to keep it straightforward and know what is there. Now you can see the local subnet selections are all grayed out because this is a tunnel interface. The access will be provided via the access rules and the routes. So let's go ahead and save this one on the main office firewall. While that's activating, let's go back to the remote firewall. Let's finish configuring this. Select port B and 10.1.2.5.3. And let's set its ID types. Set this to the interface. And just double check that everything is correct on here. Initiate, IP, activate on save. We have the RSA key, listening interface. We have the correct IP as a gateway. Now we have the IP addresses in here. And it's all good. Let's go ahead and save this. Oh, look, green on green up on the first try. It's good. I've already created the firewall rules on both the devices to ensure that everything runs smooth and to save some time. So let's go ahead and create the routes needed. We're going to use SD-WAN. So let's go to routing and SD-WAN policy routing. Let's go to add. As you see, there's gateways required. Let's go check that. Let's go to gateways. We already have the gateways configured here. As you can see, they're checking and validating. These are green. So we're good. Let's go configure that route now. Let's call this to remote office LAN. Keeping it very descriptive. You have a description field. If you really want to fill that out on there to give a little bit more detail, just like really putting in as much precise information as I can in the naming scheme. Let's go ahead and select port one, as that's the traffic incoming interface. 
we're going to define this as the LAN, apply, and destination network. This will be the remote office. Let me check that. Remote office LAN, apply. You can also do application objects in here if you'd like. Let's just take a look at this. You can create many different objects in here based off of applications. And with synchronized security, you can do it even off of the cloud ones. So if you need to route certain things across the VPNs, you can do that as well. Now let's select the gateways. Since most cases, the MPLS network is generally more reliable, faster, less overhead. Let's go ahead and set that as our primary gateway. And on the backup gateway, let's go ahead and set that to the tunnel interface. So let's create that remote office. I'm just turning this down just for the demonstration. Generally, 30 seconds is good enough on here, but we just want to ensure that uh, when I do some testing that it reacts faster. And now we're not sitting around waiting. One of the things that we have to do on here is apply an IP address to the XFRM interface that was created. I really like to just rename these back to what that is, whatever IPsec it is. It's just something I do just so I know when I'm looking through on the list that I can tell which one it's directly associated with. Let's refer back to the diagram on what IP we are supposed to be putting here. This is the 10.77.2. And we're doing a slash 30. I'm going to save. Now that we have that XRFM interface with an IP on it, we can set up its gateway. Let's set the primary to MPLS, and let's create new for the backup over here. Now you can see two main offices. I want the gateway IP to be pointed at the other side. Once again, let's set its interval to five. Let's save. We have successfully created the route. Now let's go back to the main office. Now you can see here in the SD-WAN policy on the remote office, there's a green dot. When you hover over it, you can see the primary gateway and the secondary gateway, or the backup gateway. And you can see the current status of both of them. They're currently up. So that means the traffic will now route over the MPLS, and then it will route over the, uh, the VPN connection. Let's go ahead and go behind one of the client devices behind the XG firewall at the main location. IP config, that's this IP, 172.16.16.18. Now let's ping the remote side, 172.18.1.3. Hey, we can ping, successful. Now let's go ahead and simulate if the MPLS went down. Since my remote firewall is a virtual appliance, I'm just gonna go into the hypervisor and disconnect the interface. One second.
As you can see here, the MPLS interface on the remote office firewall is unplugged. Now that connection is down. So now let's go over to the main office firewall and take a look at the SD-WAN routing policy. Now let's go ahead and check the gateways. As you can see here, the status for the one for the MPLS is now down, but the one for the VPN is still up. Now per our SD-WAN routing policy, we should still be able to reach the other network. Let's go to the main office client and take a look. Let's see if we can ping. We can still ping. That means the SD-WAN routing policy is working as expected. There's a lot you can do with this, and this is just a simple ping showing of an MPLS network and a tunnel interface. You can get very complex with using VoIP, using a lot of QoS on there, and even just simple things like ping, like I did. To get more information on some of the topics that we've gone over, or a lot more in-depth videos on how to configure them, here are some of the resources. One of our great ones is Sophos TechVids at techvids.sophos.com. There's a lot of how-tos in there that Sophos Support have created to help guide you through on configuration step-by-step. Step. They even cover some basic troubleshooting in there as well. Another great location is Sophos Community. We have an XG Firewall group in there that has a lot of dedicated XG Firewall users out there. Some of them have been using Sophos products for many years. They're very active and they're willing and wanting to help out. We also have community support members from Sophos itself. They'll help you out and answer your questions and guide you through anything that you may need. Then also, a lot of people may not know is that there is the XG Help Docs. In the upper right, there is a help option. Whenever you're on a certain screen, you can click help. As long as you have internet connection, it'll go out and pull the latest information and bring you right to that location for that feature. And it may help you out or understand more in depth about that feature itself and some configurations that you may not have known. Thank you for joining me here today. That is the conclusion of my session. And upcoming in session eight is all about managing your XG estates inside of Sofo Central. You'll be able to manage multiple XG firewalls from the warehouse of Sofo Central. One central location of controlling multiple XG firewalls with policy management. You'll not want to miss out on a lot of the great information coming up in the future sessions. You'll learn a lot about the future of the XG firewall. Thank you. Great, thank you. We are now going to go over to our live Q&A and we have Jayesh who's going to kindly support um, hosting this with us this morning. Um, Jayesh, I've, there's several questions that's coming in so I've started to take note of them. So I'm just going to fire off um, straight away. The first one that we come in is, does Sophos XG site-to-site -site VPNs work with other firewall appliances? Yes, so Sophos XG uh, can can be configured for IPsec VPN side to side with other uh, firewalls. I mean, other vendors as well, as long as they support the uh, standard uh, IPsec protocols for phase one and phase two negotiations. So yes, it is possible. Great, um, someone's asked, can you show me um, user digital certificate over pre-shared key option? Yep, sure. So if we go to one of the tunnels that is already configured on my appliance, um, it will show three options over here. Uh, this one, authentication type. So in this tunnel, it is already uh, configured as RSA key, but you have the option to go uh, and select uh, either pre-shared key or digital certificate or RSA key. So all these three options are available. Great. Can Sophos XG Firewall utilize dynamic routing with its tunnel interface VPNs? Right, that's right. So it is possible to use dynamic routing such as uh, OSPF, uh, BGP uh, with the, over the IPsec side-to-side uh, -side VPN. So we also support ECMP that is equal cost multi-path for uh, load balancing as well. So it is possible, yeah. 
Can the SD WAN feature be used to route traffic across VPNs? Yes, SD WAN can be used for VPN routing as well. So if you have a look at this particular example on the screen, I have exit to, I mean, I have exit deployed on my AWS uh, account, and uh, there is a site to site VPN already configured and connected. So what I have done is uh, once the VPN is connected, uh, obviously it's a tunnel based interface. So there would be an XFRM interface connected over here. Uh, I have connected, I have configured it, given an IP address, and then uh, navigate to routing, um, and then gateway, created a custom gateway on that uh, XFRM interface, this one. Um, and then finally calling it out for SD-WAN routing uh, policy. So this one is already configured. So if you have a look, uh, this is the this is how the policy route would look like. The source would be my uh, internal LAN networks and destination would be my AWS resources network. And in the routing section, I have selected that custom created gateway that is VPN gateway. And in some of the scenarios, you might also need MPLS as a backup. So you can select MPLS over here as a backup and uh, use the sd one policy routing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank um, you. What are some of the best practices for deploying remote access SSL VPN? Yeah, so the best practice was already discussed uh, in the session, but uh, specific to SSL VPN, if uh, we have to say, then obviously it's recommended to use MFA or multi-factor authentication whenever possible and uh, only allow the required resources instead of allowing any. So what uh, I have seen generally in some of the customer networks and exe firewall configuration that when they create a firewall rule, they would simply select a uh, destination network as uh, any instead of uh, selecting a particular resource. Even in this example, if you see, I have allowed 10, 13, 1.0 slash 24, which means any IP that belongs to this subnet uh, would be allowed. But uh, if you have limited resources uh, in your LAN or DMZ network, that's need, that needs to be accessed via VPN. So you need to configure those particular resources only. So only allow those resources that are required for the remote users. So that is one thing. And uh, other thing is uh, now that you know that uh, the SSL VPN uh, Sorry, the Sophos Connect uh, client now supports SSL VPN configuration as well. So uh, from admin perspective, the deployment has become very easy. All you need to do is uh, just uh, take a provisioning file, enter the IP address of XZ, uh, and then uh, share the provisioning file with all your users. So they will just import that config file, enter their credentials, and enter the OTP if multi-factor authentication is also configured and get connected so the advantage of using that provisioning file with uh, sophos connect is you don't need to uh, share the configuration file with the users every time when you make a change in the vpn policy because uh, it will dynamically uh, detect the changes when it tries to connect and will accordingly connect with those updated changes in the policy so this eliminates uh, the overhead of administration task for the network admin. So they just need to share the configuration file one time and they would be good to go. So those are some of the key things that you can consider uh, while configuring SSL VPN. Great, thanks for that detailed answer. Uh, next up, what types of multi-factor authentication are supported by Sophos XG? Uh, as I said, multi-factor authentication is definitely supported. So uh, we, we support time-based authentication. One of the application that we already have is Sophos Authenticator, or even you can use a third-party authenticate, authenticator like uh, Duo. Uh, so if, if it already has a radius server as an authentication mechanism, we can integrate XZ with that radius server and make use of that uh, multi-factor authentication as well. And uh, another thing to note is uh, the uh, OTP feature is uh, available for these uh, functionalities like web admin, SSL VPN, IPsec, as well as user portal. 
Great, thank you. And uh, next up, can we configure a remote access VPN for mobile devices? So for mobile devices, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any Sophos native div, uh, client, uh, but uh, you can obviously, if you are planning to use uh, L2TP or uh, IPsec, you can use the native client, which is already there in your mobile device. Or uh, if you want to use SSL VPN, uh, you can use the open VPN connect client, which is already supported for Android as well as for iOS devices. And we do have a, a knowledge base article on community link as well. So you can uh, just visit that site and check out the configuration step by step, how we can uh, configure it on XE firewall. Thank you. Next, is it possible to do SD1 routing on IPsec site to site VPN between two Sophos XG firewalls? Yeah, so this is exactly similar to the uh, previous question that I just answered. So once the VPN is connected, uh, we just need to go to routing, uh, con configure a custom gateway, and then in the SD1 routing policy, you can. Uh, use that custom gateway that is created on your site-to-site -site VPN, specifically tunnel-based interface, route-based VPN, yeah. Uh, we've got a question, which of the remote connections shown today require additional licenses and or do they come as part of the standard uh, package? So uh, yeah, IP second as a, uh, and SSL pin both are included in the base firewall. So you do not need to uh, pay anything extra for that. But yes, if in case you want to get the traffic uh, scanned with the web filter policy or application filter policy, or you, you need to do some security scannings on that, then yes, you need to purchase those relevant uh, license features so that the security scannings and web filtering can uh, can be applied on that traffic as well. But to use it just for VPN functionality, it's uh, like the license is not required. It's included in the base firewall. Um, I've had a couple of questions similar is, um, can we push VPN software to clients? And is there any demonstration you can show us how to do that? So Sophos Connect uh, deployment is possible via group policy object uh, in uh, domain controller environments there is a kb article uh, which is already live on community so we, we will be sharing that link in the faq document because i know this is uh, asked very frequently so we'll we'll share that link with the audience it's there but we will share it yeah thank you um is it possible to configure sso in sophos firewall sso like there are so many methods of SSO in firewall. So short answer would be yes. But if the if the question is specific to VPN, then yes, VPN SSO is also supported. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, when we navigate to authentication services, um, let it load. Yeah, so in the services, we need to make sure that whichever VPN you want for SSO, your um, uh, external authentication uh, server should be selected in this particular section as the preferred uh, authentication server. Otherwise, your SSO for VPN would not work. Great. Next up, how many SSL client licenses are supported for free with an XG firewall? So as I said, uh, there is no charge for the uh, usage of the VPN client. So it, it's, it's not needed, I would say. Right, next up, now I'll do a final more because I see we are coming up to the hour. How can I connect my XG firewall to my web portal? I've added in serial numbers, but unable to access it. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, how can I connect my XG firewall to my web portal? I added in my serial numbers, but was unable to access it. Mm, how can I add XG firewall to the uh, web portal? Like, I'm not sure which web portal. I think uh, the, the question means a user portal and they're trying to access user portal and it's not opening. That is what the question, I guess. So to, uh, so to make sure that a user portal is accessible, you need to enable that particular tick mark on whichever zone you want it. So for example, 
uh, in this one, uh, uh, user portal, this is the option, and this needs to be enabled on uh, van zone or VPN zone or whichever zone uh, the traffic is coming from then only the user portal would be accessible. Great, thank you so much, Jayesh. That's, um, we can kind of conclude that today because I can see there's a couple um, of admin questions which I can kindly assist with in the next coming slides. So I'm just going to no make problem. myself the presenter again. Thank you so much. Sure. So for those who've joined us this week, um, you know that we've been offering a free architect training certification voucher for you guys to um, increase your learning further after the XG Academy. So in able to get this, um, you have to join four or more live sessions for us for the duration of the XG Academy. And this is both available for our end users and partners. And again, these are for XG Firewall e-learning training course vouchers. Um, the vouchers will all be sent to you automatically for those who attend four or more live sessions and the email will be due to go out at least one to two weeks after the academy has finished. Um, just a reminder that we are back again tomorrow for the next innovation session which is getting the most from XG Firewall managing your states and again that is the same time between 10 and 11 J GMT London Dublin time. And again, we have um, a few more minutes, so I'll leave the live Q&A open just for you to finalise any questions with our software experts who are on the call today. Once again, thank you so much for joining our XG Academy. Um, we will look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow for our final um, series coming up closing this week. Thank you and have a lovely day. So this is the final um, minute warning before we close today's webinar. Just a reminder for those who are still with us, um, the session has been recorded and will be posted on our events page, which is displayed on the screen within the next 24 hours. Just like the print screen available, if you just scroll down, you will see that the green button will say watch on demand when the video is available. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow when we go to conclude the end of this week's XG Farmall Academy. Thank you and take care.